On today's show, takeaways from day three of Houston Rockets training camp. Could we possibly be seeing an Alperin, Shingun, Steven Adams double big lineup at some point this season? How the Rockets are working to improve their outside shooting and why Cam Whitmore has been a standout so far in training camp. It's all coming up on today's Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. The comments help us on. Do a drive-by. Just say go Rockets. Tell us how you're feeling about training camp, all that good stuff. Now, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet, and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked on Rockets part of your day every single day, whether it's on your way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym. Thank you so much for being an everydayer. A lot to get to, a lot of insights from day three of Houston Rockets training camp. Uh, some really good kind of tidbits from Ime Udoka and Jabari Smith Jr. on the team working towards becoming better uh, as far as the outside shooting is concerned. That was kind of a weakness of this team last season, so we'll get some insights from them. Uh, we're also going to dive into why uh, Cam Whitmore has been a standout so far through the early stages of training camp. Uh, Dylan Brooks with some very glowing praise for him. Uh, but what we're going to start with here is a question that was burning at the forefront of my mind. And, you know, I, if, if you've been a Rockets fan for, for more than a minute, you'll remember we had this same question way back when, when we thought, okay, well, would we ever see, you know, some Alperin, Shingun, Christian Wood, double big man lineups, that kind of thing back during the Steven Silas era. And, I, I kept wondering this because everywhere that Steven Adams has gone, he's been such an impactful presence, at regardless of what team he's been on, whether it's the Thunder, the Pelicans, the Grizzlies, he's always had a pretty major impact wherever he's gone. And right now, he's slated to only get about 15 or so minutes, more, more than likely, backing up Alper and Shingun on a nightly basis. So if, you, if he winds up being as impactful as we kind of expect him to be in a Rockets jersey, then how do you how do you increase that minutes threshold without also taking away those minutes from Alper and Shingun? And the answer is clear as daylight. You might have to try and find a way to play those two guys together. So I got the chance to ask Ime Odoka about that. So let's go ahead and hear his answer. And that's how we're going to tee off today's show. We've talked about it. We've looked at it. Um, you know, with our depth, we do a lot of several different ways. But um, at the same time, when you do go double big, you like to have one of those be a shooting big, so to speak. And if we can get to that, then that's a possibility. But um, you know, it also takes away from a lot of our wings and, and the depth we have of you know, multi, multi position players that can play the floor. So, some we've discussed and looked at, but um, you, know, I don't know, you don't want to take away some of your strengths and some of the other guys that can't play the floor. How important is Alpern shot from maybe being to that point that you could comfortably have him out there as a spacing big next to Steve? Not far. He has the touch and the shot. It's more of a mentality to look for those shots and not pass them up. You know, a lot of times he's on the perimeter, he's pump faking basically nobody, and, and I respect that. They're going to make improvements. So as he continues to grow and get more confident in that, um, obviously that opens up everything for him and our team. But um, you know, more so a mentality than an actual skill set because he has the shot. I just got a highlight here. Uh, so first off, a couple really good kind of anecdotes from Ime in that quote. First off, Ime saying sometimes he's just out on the perimeter pump faking nobody. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Ime just calls it how it is. Like, I don't know how many different times we talked about on this show, like when Al P, like he just, he lost the confidence from the perimeter, right? He'd be out there and he'd, he'd, uh, he would do his patented pump fake and there'd be nobody near him and there's not even a reason to be pump faking. But I, I love that what he said is he's got the the touch and the ability, right, to, to make those shots. It's more about... Uh, kind of getting back to a place of confidence in in willing being willing to take those shots. And it's kind of felt that way for a while with Alpi, right? Like, we know that Alpi's got great touch. He's a finesse player at heart. He's got the 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 soft touch in and around the rim. He makes all kinds of wild shots. We saw him introduce the, uh, 
the the flamingo shot last season. It's just about rediscovering his confidence from long distance. Now, I will say a couple of the other parts of this answer, uh, the fact that they have looked at it and they have considered it is pretty big. We know that Ime Odoka has run double big lineups in the past. Now, albeit Al Horford and Rob Williams is a very different double big lineup than what Alper and Shingun and Steven Adams would be. But at the same time, if in Ime's mind, they're not that far away from being able to do it, depending on where Alper and Shingun gets with his three ball, then that's something that we could conceivably see at some point this season. Maybe it's not something they roll out on night one of the NBA season, uh, game one of 82, but it's definitely something that I think in certain matchups could be very favorable, right? You look at certain teams out there that have a lot of size. The first team that comes to mind is the Memphis Grizzlies, right? They're going to be running out Zach Eady and Jaron Jackson Jr. at their four or five spots. There's no reason why I don't think the Rockets wouldn't be able to get some Al P. Stevo kind of double big minutes in a matchup like that in order to match the physicality, match the size, match the rebounding, all of that while also increasing the output uh, from Steven Adams increasing uh, the minutes that he's able to get in a given game. Now, I will say the other part of uh, Ime's answer made a lot of sense, too, when he highlighted the fact that if you do run double big, even if it's only for an extra five, seven minutes a night, whatever, uh, with Adams and Shingun, then you are cutting into some of the available minutes for some of the other multifaceted players or multi-positional players on the roster, right? If you if you up Steven Adams' minutes, whose minutes are you then taking from, right? Are you taking away from Tari Eason's minutes? Are you taking away from Jabari's minutes? Are you taking away from Amin Thompson's minutes, Dylan Brooks' minutes? Like, who is the the guy whose minutes ultimately will crater if you decide that that's the direction that you want to go organizationally. Now, I do think, again, it, it's it's lineup versatility at the end of the day, and there's options there. It's interesting that they have thought about it, that they've toyed with it. Um, and I will say a little bit later on in Emay's availability, which, again, all these availabilities are available on the YouTube channel. I did, I'm not playing them in full today because there were a bunch of different segments that I wanted to get to. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more from Emay in just a moment about the shooting for the roster. But he did highlight later on uh, when asked about whether or not Jabari Smith Jr. would be playing any minutes at the five this season. He said, well, playing Jabari at the five or playing him as a small ball five, similar to playing Jeff Green, gives you certain... Uh, advantages as far as schemes go. It allows you to do certain things, but he had also at the same time highlighted the fact that the Rockets have a really strong center rotation of of like real bigs in uh, Jock Landale and Steven Adams, both backing up Alper and Shingun, and that those guys bring certain elements to the table that you don't get if you're playing Jabari or Jeff at the five, things like rebounding, things like screening. And at least as it stands right now, I'm sure that we will see some situational minutes with one or both of Jabari and or Jeff Green playing some minutes at the five, but it kind of seems like right now, and this was a big problem last season, when Alper and Shingun went to the bench, the Rockets didn't have any legitimate screening presence on the floor. Uh, Amin Thompson got better as a screener as the season went on, especially after he was injected into the starting lineup and playing out of the dunker spot and all those different things. He got better as a screening and rolling presence offensively, but they didn't have a legit big body screener to set hard screens, roll to the rim, to rebound, to help anchor the painted area. And I do fully expect the Rockets to really lean into the fact that they'd have not one, but two guys backing up Alper and Shingun. Jock Landale healthy now this season, and Steven Adams, a completely different kind of piece of the puzzle that just didn't even exist last year for the Rockets to, to try and, you know, incorporate into their schemes. So I, I feel like we're headed for much less time of, of Jabari or Jeff Green playing at that five spot, but at the end of the day it's always going to be matchup dependent and Ime is going to try and put the best five out there on the floor to win a game, and if that best five means Jabari's the one at the five spot and it's a small ball lineup or Uncle Jeff Green, or if that best five means that it's Alper and Shingun at the four and Steven Adams at the five, then Ime is going to put the best five on the floor to ultimately win a game. Coming up, want to get into how this Houston Rockets team improves from long distance. Shooting was the Achilles heel of this Houston Rockets team last season. We're going to get there in just one moment. 
First, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Look, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the exact same page where you actually place your bets. You're going to get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Just head on over to FanDuel.com. You take a look at so many different odds. You can take a look at the different season awards, conference winners, division winners, or just the outright Super Bowl favorites. Right now, the Chiefs are at plus 500 to win it all. The 49ers plus 650. The Ravens plus 800. The Buffalo Bills at plus 1,000. The Lions right there at plus 1,100. And then your Houston Texans sitting in sixth place odds at plus 13. 13- hundred to win the Super Bowl this season. So for all those odds and so much more, head on over to FanDuel.com. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Let's go ahead and dive into what Ime Odoka had to say in regards to the shooting for this Rockets roster and how they can improve as a shooting team this season. You uh, spoke yesterday about studying some of the things that need improving and drills that apply to that. How, how do you improve the three-point shooting? I think our biggest thing is uh, lack of spacing at times. Um, you know, not get to the correct spots. Uh, just draws the crowd and you're shooting more contested shots than uncontested. Uh, that's one of the biggest things. And then playing with a certain amount of pace that can get you to some of those shots. And um, I mean, we showed a ton of that. Saw a ton of that in the offseason. And, um, and our, our spacing is a big thing, though. You know, operating off Alper and the guy who gets double teamed a lot, you should be getting a lot more open looks. And so try to clean up our spacing in these spots. The guys that have jumped out at you is showing improvement as shooters either in the workouts over the summer or in these three days. Anybody that has seemed to have made strides in the ah. season? Yeah, I think a lot of our guys in the you didn't see Tari a ton last year, but he's a guy that, um, like I've said, you don't have to call a ton of plays before he finds the spots and he's, he's been shooting it well. Jabari, just with his release, um, quickness, being able to shoot off the move and not just be spot up, has really improved there. And I think just guys in general, shot selection is going to be a big thing. And you know, talking about recognition with whether it's Cam, Jay, or the different guys, uh, you know, being ready to shoot. Your team's guard in a specific way. And so you want to see improvement across the board with your team. And I think uh, I mean, the shot looks much smoother. It's, it sounds like what you were saying before is it's not the shot, it's actually the ball movement and other things before the shot that will improve the shooting. Yeah, I mean, preparation is a big thing, knowing where you're going to get your shots from. And um, as I mentioned with Alfie and the post getting double teamed or Fred, you know, the guy that's always probing and looking for guys. Uh, getting to your spacing is a big thing, but um, it's almost more so shot recognition than the actual shooting. And so you're taking a lot of tough contested shots. I mean, your, your percentage is gonna, naturally going to go down. So um, I think cleaning that up, which we did some last year, and we're going to continue to do this year, will make everybody's numbers go. So some really great insight from Ime Udoka and how they're working on cleaning up the shot profile this season. I thought a big part of it was, you know, him talking about playing with more pace, right? Being able to get to some of the shots that they just weren't capitalizing on last season, right? You think about how good of a defensive team this Rockets team was last year. They got a lot of stops and then they would just walk the ball up after getting a great defensive stop. They would, you know, not really take advantage of some of those transition opportunities when the defense, when the opposing defense wasn't set, being able to, you know, catch guys on the perimeter or get guys, you know, great spot up looks there. And then also highlighting the fact that, you know, they have a guy in Alper and Shingun who basically commands a double team every time he touches the ball. So being able to be in the right spots outside of some of those sets in the half court where Al P is able to really draw an extra defender, draw that extra attention, and then being able to just take advantage of some of those opportunities. I love that he highlighted, you know, different guys up and down the roster, Tari, Jabari, he gave a shout out to a men as far as just improving uh, as far as shooting goes. Now, I, what does improvement look for Amin Thompson as far as shooting, right? Does he go from 13% to to 26%? Um, I mean, that's a double. That's doubling. That's that's really good. Um, or is he maybe more talking in terms of, um, in terms of like elsewhere shooting on the floor? Because Amin Thompson, he might not ever have to develop an outside ball, you know, an outside three-point shot in order to become a really, really effective player, right? Even if he just develops like a semi reliable, you know, midi or floater when he gets to the paint, um, then the three ball can come much, much later on or or possibly not ever if he doesn't really ever uh, add it to his game. He'd still be an incredibly talented player. Now, Jabari Smith Jr. was also kind of asked some questions in regards to the Rockets shooting, and I thought he had some some good insight to share as well. 
there are plenty of strong shooters in the NBA. Has Reed been notably impressive in his first few days? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, his his form, his his rotation on his ball, he's, he's definitely got the form, got the confidence. Like he's one of the uh, best shooters I've seen. You know what I'm saying? The workouts and stuff. But um, I think that's that, that, that's something everybody knows. You know what I'm saying? I don't think that's a secret. You know what I'm saying? He's a shooter. He can shoot the ball. That's what he do. Is he letting it fly with abandon from deep? Um, for sure. You know, um, that's what we're encouraging. We're encouraging to get up more threes, and um, he fits right into that mold. So anytime he's open, they we we encourage him to fly. You know, was talking about how the shooting can improve with better shot selection, better ball movement. Are you seeing some of that in these workouts or over the summertime? Who said that? I'm in. Oh, okay. Did I say I'm in? I'm sorry. I'm in. Oh, okay. I was about to say. What? I'm sure he'd agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's just when you play the right way, you get good shots. You know what I'm saying? When you when you play for each other, you um, you draw two past the ball. That's when you that's when you get open shots. You know what I'm saying? That'll increase the the threes we take. You know what I'm saying? So we're just trying to try to build that. Um, playing unselfish, and that's gonna increase our success. How important is that to improve this team offensively? For my uh, it's very important. You know, I feel like um, our strong suit is our defense. You know what I'm saying? Um, offense is definitely. A area we can improve on, especially half court offense. So that's what we've been working on. You know what I'm saying? And um, just trying to play fast and play in transition as much as possible. Can you talk about how you improved over this offseason and your first season? The three point percentage went up each year. Do um, you believe eventually you get to see a 40 percent three point shooting? How much will that look like? Uh, yeah, definitely. You know, I want to shoot more threes this year. Uh, definitely raise my attempts, you know what I'm saying, and just just, just be a shooter, you know what I'm saying? That's what this team needs. That's what this team wants out of me, and uh, I'm ready to take that role on, you know what I'm saying? I feel like I'm definitely a 40% three-point shooter. I've done it before, you know what I'm saying? So let's just, just get back to that. Um, yeah, you know, that's something I worked on this offseason, you know what I'm saying? Just moving, uh, trying to run off pin downs and, and catching – Catching the ball off screens and stuff like that, you know what I'm saying? It's tough, it's difficult, but I feel like I've, I've worked on this. And the, and the main thing is just having the confidence coming off of them, you know what I'm saying? If you got daylight, let it fly. So that's what I've been working on. So that was Jabari Smith Jr. talking about the shooting for this Rocket team. And it kind of seems like a consistent theme across Ime, Jabari, and then even Dylan Brooks. We won't hear him actually say this because I don't have it prepped as far as a clip concern is concerned. But even Dylan Brooks was kind of asked, how does this team improve uh, the outside shooting and Dylan was just flat. He's no hesitation. He was like more reps. We just need to shoot more shots. And some part of that comes from just getting higher quality shots, getting better quality shots, right? Drive and kick, you know, getting out to, you know, shooting more corner threes, all those different things. And so it seems like a recurring theme here is not necessarily that this team doesn't have good high quality three point shooters on the roster, but more so that they didn't do a good enough job of taking advantage of opportunities that they probably missed a lot of last season, especially when they were playing with a much slower pace uh, in the kind of first half or first two thirds of the season, basically before the all-star break. Um, and then just increasing the pace. And once they do increase the pace, then that'll afford them more of those opportunities, right? They'll be able to increase their overall three-point volume. And again, just playing the right way is kind of the message that has been coming across from a lot of these guys, right? Is if you are playing a good team brand of basketball, if you're sharing the basketball, if you are attacking and then kicking it out, making the right passes, then there's going to be plenty of opportunities there. I was very intrigued by Jabari saying that he has worked on, you know, and, got, and tried to get more comfortable with being a movement shooter because I feel like that's the next area where if you if you're Jabari Smith Jr. and you want to get up into that you know six seven eight attempts per game kind of range from long distance you know guys who can reliably self-create their own shots guys like Jalen guys like Fred who can get you know get their own shot off pretty much whenever they want by either utilizing like a quick pick and roll or just self-creating those guys can get those attempts. Now, are they high quality attempts, right? If you've got a hand in your face, if you're trying to break down a defender and get to a step back, whatever. But for a guy like Jabari, who doesn't, you know, necessarily have the self creation ability that some of those guys do, where, how else does he increase his three point attempts other than, you know, just luck of the draw, him being in the right spot at the right time off of like an Alper and Shingun double team or something in a kickout pass. The only way for him to reliably increase his three-point volume is to find other avenues for him to be able to be effective from long distance and, and to generate those opportunities. He's going to have to be able to move. He's going to be able to have to catch and shoot. He's going to have to come off pin downs. He's going to have to come off screens. And when he's able to do that and when he's able to do that with consistency and regularity, 
it is going to add a ton to his game. He's already spoken about wanting to become more effective in and around the basket this season, right? Playing a little bit bigger, but at the same time, he can't just forget about the outside part of his game, right? If he wants to be a true three-level scoring threat, he's got the mid-range and he's got the outside game on lock right now. Needs to improve the outside game a little bit, right? A huge improvement last year, up to 36.3% shooting from deep, but... If he becomes a more dynamic outside shooter, a guy that can come off screens, that can catch and shoot quickly um, with confidence and with a quick release, all that stuff, as well as improving his ability to attack off the dribble, get to the interior, finish around the rim, then that's how you become a truly well-rounded offensive presence. So some exciting stuff from Jabari Smith Jr., Coming up, I want to hear from Dylan Brooks and why Cam Whitmore has been a standout so far through Houston Rockets training camp. We're going to get there in just one moment. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, before kind of highlighting some of the uh, the scrimmage that we were able to witness uh, at day three of Houston Rockets training camp, I want to get into uh, really quickly why Cam Whitmore has been a standout, at least especially in the eyes of Dylan Brooks, which again, getting praise from Dylan Brooks is uh, no no small matter here. Let's go ahead and hear what Dylan Brooks had to say about Cam Whitmore. Um, playing a lot of defense um, and then sharing the basketball. Um, he's been focusing on that all summer. Um, and then just playing both sides. Playing both sides, even though he's not getting the shots that he wants. Um, he's playing both sides, he's playing hard. He's not getting discouraged at any, at any moment. That's some pretty strong praise from Dylan Brooks about how Cam Whitmore looks through the early part of camp. And look, the thing with Cam Whitmore is... You know, he he has all the tools to be such an impactful player, especially on the defensive end of the court. We saw moments, some really special moments from Cam last season, especially when he was matched up, you know, one on one, man to man with certain guys. He doesn't get bull. He's got an NBA body already like the joke was last year he was a gigantic man baby because he's he's already fi- there is no like oh once Cam Whitmore fills out and you know spends more time in the weight room no no he's ready to go right now the thing with Cam is some of the the defensive or, or you know the the lack of defensive impact last year came from you know things like defensive awareness or processing or familiarity with schemes different things and sometimes just flat out effort right this year And I've had to be the bearer of bad news at times, you know, trying to share the fact that when you look at the Rockets bench brigade, right, Reed, Cam, Amin, Tari, and Steven Adams, of all those five guys, the guy who is likely to get the least amount of minutes of the bunch is going to probably be Cam Whitmore. Now, if he is a different type of defender this season, then there is a world where Cam Whitmore can absolutely carve himself out a much larger role on this Rockets team and coming off of the Rockets bench unit simply by just being a more dynamic defender, a more impactful defender. Because the problem is you already see Amin Thompson. He's already the team's best perimeter defender, already the team's best overall defender. I I have zero qualms about saying that, making that claim right now. Tari Eason is a different type of defender than Amin Thompson, but he's also incredibly impactful in his own right. There is maybe not, I won't say a chasm between where those two guys are at and where Cam Whitmore is at, But if Cam Whitmore can just bridge the gap, if he can just get closer to where those guys are at defensively or or at least just become a more impactful presence on the defensive side of the ball, whether that be the ability to really clamp guys one-on-one, whether it be just better defensive awareness, better attention to detail, better at switching, better communication, all these little things, all the hard work that goes into being a high-quality NBA defender. If he can close that gap a little bit, offensively, He provides something that nobody else on this Rockets roster has. He is, I I would go so far as to say he is the best play finisher on this entire Rockets roster. And his skill set complements pretty much everybody on this Rockets roster offensively, right? Because you put Cam on the floor and he's going to space the floor. He's going to knock down open threes. He's going to be able to drive the ball in and finish, finish at the rim. He's a terror in transition. All these different things that Cam brings to the table offensively, things that, Tari Eason and Amin Thompson do not bring to the table offensively. So that is going to be the number one way for Cam Whitmore to earn more run this season, to earn a bigger role off the Houston Rockets bench, is for him to improve on the defensive side of the ball. Look, it's an Ine Odoka-led team. You're not going to have a big role on this team if you don't play good, high-quality defense. Like, that's just a fact of the matter, right? Everybody on this team has to pull their weight defensively. They want to be not just another top-10 defense. They want to push for top-five defense this season. Now, we did see 
we got to see a little bit of Rocket scrimmage footage, uh, probably about four or five minutes or so. Uh, at day three of training camp, the footage is posted on the YouTube channel. So if you haven't seen it yet, be sure to go check that out. Um, it, not a not a like an overabundance of amazing takeaways. Uh, however, there were some insights. So, for example, uh, the final score between the two teams, the, there was a gray team and a black team. So the roster was split in two. Uh, the gray team finished uh, with a final score of 84 points. The black team finished with a final score of 69 points. Nice. For the gray team, not for the black team. Um, and on the gray team, uh, on the court, uh, we saw Alperin Shingoon, Dylan Brooks, uh, Marquise uh, Noel, Aaron Holiday, and Cam Whitmore. That was the five on the court for the gray team. And then the black team on the court when we got to witness the scrimmage was Jalen Green, Fred Van Vliet, Jock Landale, Jay Sean Tate, and Nate Williams. Now, the bench unit for both these teams, because, again, this they did a full-blown scrimmage, and we only got to see the very end of it. Um, so those were not like the 5-on-5 the five five team that had led to the final score of 84-69. Um, there were other players contributing to this. The bench unit for the gray team included Jabari, Amin, Uncle Jeff, Nafali Dante, and Jack McVeigh. And then the bench unit for the black team included uh, Reed Shepard, Tari Eason, Steven Adams, Jermaine Samuels, Nate Hinton, and Thon Maker. So those were how the two teams were ultimately split up. And when you look at the two teams, at least when you look at like the pieces that were like, I guess, on the floor, the first two things that stand out is one, uh, the team around Alper and Shingun absolutely complimented like the uh, whatever you want to call it, Shin Hub, you know, the the, you know, having him as the, the offensive fulcrum. There really wasn't. I mean, you know, Noel was, I guess, your primary Noel and Holiday were kind of your primary ball handlers on the court with Shingun in that five man lineup. Uh, but all all four of those guys, Brooks, Noel, Holiday, Whitmore are all guys that can space the floor. Um and allow Alper and Shingun to kind of operate and then kick it out to, you know, to, to wide open shooters, which is exactly what happened. There was a possession that led to uh, Cam Whitmore getting a wide open three in the corner. Um, and then there was also another possession uh, that led to an Alper and Shingun kind of Cam Whitmore backdoor cut. And then like a uh, Cam had this like filthy reverse, like windmill dunk. You know, it was, it was just absolutely absurd to see. Uh, so it's good to see that Cam Whitmore's uh, hops haven't gone anywhere. But then you look at the black team, uh, Jalen, Fred, Jock, Jay Sean Tate, and Nate Williams. And at least when we originally shared the clips and everything, uh, the immediate reaction from this, and my immediate reaction seeing it on the court was, damn, the spacing is rough in that group. Because Jalen and Fred are the only sh are the only shooters out there. Because Jock Landale's not a shooter. Jay Sean Tate's not a shooter. And Nate Williams is definitely not a shooter. So that was, like, uh, the, the spacing on that team was pretty rough around the edges. Um, now, granted, there were a lot of, there were uh, some other spacers that were sitting on the bench with Reed Shepard and Tari Eason. But... Even then, you're not going to be running. I highly doubt we're going to see any like three guard lineups of like Reed Shepard, Jalen Green, and Fred Van Vliet this season. Um, so Reed was there kind of as the backup guard. So the spacing on that roster was kind of painful. A lot of the other floor spacers went on the kind of the Shingoon side of things for the, how the two teams are broken up. And I wonder how much of that was intentional by Ime. I wonder how much of that was Ime wanting to see Jalen trying to attack and work with minimal floor spacing versus he wanted to see LP work. And, and you know, if, if the black team decided to double team Alper and Shingoon, he had plenty of spacing around him to take advantage of the double teams. Who knows? Um, but gray team thoroughly, it seemed like they thoroughly outperformed the black team in the scrimmage. Um, we didn't see a ton in the way of like, you know, defense or, or guys breaking, you know, guys, guys blowing up plays or anything like that. I will say though, the rocket social team did share a clip of Reed Shepard where Reed Shepard in the span of like 45 seconds got, a midi pull up, so pump fake to three, dribbled into a midi pull up, went down on the other end, got a poke check steal on Aaron Holiday, comes down, gets an assist at the rim, uh, passes the ball, gets an assist to Thon Maker at the rim, then comes back down on the other end and gets another stop on Aaron Holiday, who was driving into the paint, and Reed Shepard went up and 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 blocked him on this drive to the rim. Reed Shepard is just a gamer, guys. Like the dude, it works hard. He hustles. And I cannot wait to see him actually in action this upcoming season. Like every time you hear people talk about him, every time you see him in action, he's so incredibly poised, so gifted. Um, 
it it really feels like the Rockets the Rockets may have seriously struck gold here with the Brooklyn Nets pick jumping all the way up to number three and being able to come away with him as like the final piece of the rebuilding years. Um, and again, it wasn't even like they tanked last season to get Reed Shepard. The fact that they got him off of somebody else's woes is just flat out incredible. But I am curious uh, your thoughts on what you've seen out of Houston Rockets training camp so far. How do you feel about things like the double big lineup or the Rockets attempts to improve their shooting on this squad? Uh, and what about Cam Whitmore's role this upcoming season? Let me know your thoughts in the YouTube comments. But as always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts. Uh, but as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. We look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.